Good morning, boys and girls. Welcome to an unused Saturday morning. We have two hours of outdoors headed your way, and we hope that you will join us this morning. It's my privilege to uh, offer you a two or three minutes here of self-promotion. Before we get started, I will tell you the telephone numbers are... 404-872-0750 in the Atlanta area and across the country at 800-972-8255. The program in the fourth quarter, that's the right now, brought brought to you by, <clears throat> excuse me, Works Tools, Real Smoke, Stripling's General Store, Tough Shed, CVA Muzzle Loaders, Snellville Heating and Air, Appalachian Gun Range, and Pawn Teeson's Outdoor Apparel, and Rocco's Pub, and Arctic Ice. You know, I was thinking, uh, things just pop in. Uh, a couple of the sponsors' products, uh, whether they're sponsors or not, that I was thinking today that once you use one, you'll wonder how you ever got along without it. One is a tough shed, and two, surprisingly, is Arctic Ice. Once you start using Arctic Ice, you don't have to buy ice again. So, there you are. We've got no politics over the next two hours. We're talking outdoors. We're talking hunting and fishing and spending time with your family and enjoying the great outdoors. It's fall best time of the year you get to hunt you get to fish we get to do lots and lots of things so today we will be doing uh uh a, a trip i took this week i want to describe it to you uh it was for a quality deer management association auction i took a, a lovely lady by the name of tanya higgins and we went whitetail hunting i'm going to get to tell you all about that we'll have the the radio uh the medal of honor tribute We'll have the radio prize package, the radio guest book, and so many things to talk about over the next two hours of outdoors. You can watch the show live at Facebook at O'Neill Outside. And we've got a a lot of other things right here that I'll tell you as soon as we return. This is O'Neill with O'Neill Outside. We'll be back. couple of more things to get to, please, if you don't mind. I've got kind of worry there for a moment. We have seven habits of mature bucks coming up in this next two hours. And what does it mean when a lake turns over? Do you know that? We're going to talk about that. And what is your best start to a whitetail season? Hmm. Interesting prospect. What, what, are you doing something different, something that you don't do anymore? There's so much to talk about, about whitetail hunting and the hunting season. And don't forget fall fishing. The water temperatures are changing. That has to do with the lake turning over, and we'll discuss that. And we can talk. You and I, I'd love to have some of your stories. Uh, This week we went to, uh, uh, we entertained and went hunting with Tanya Higgins and her husband. His name is Jimmy Higgins. They're from from, uh, Panama City, Florida. And we went to the Big R Farms in Musella, Georgia. It's not a very big place. They have, uh, I don't know, 1,400 acres. But it was the great hospitality. And the things that this lady has learned, she has been in quality deer management for 10 or 12 or 14 years. And she is an expert deer hunter. Learning about the bucks. Where will they show up? Where will they not show up? And the pleasure in this was not only all that, but she was using the new CVA Centerfire. Ooh. Remember now, over the last, oh my goodness, uh, 25 years, all O'Neill has ever used is a CVA muzzle loader. But now there is a CVA Centerfire. She's using a 6.5 Creedmoor round, and uh, she did a wonderful job of picking out the deer that she wanted. One that she picked out. Great food plot situation, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, One of the other self-promotions I didn't tell you about is you can pick out O'Neill's book. It's called 
people and places along the way. O'Neill Outside. You can see reviews of that book at Amazon. You can purchase it at Amazon. Or you can purchase it off my website at O'NeillOutside.com. And if you then I will sign the book and personalize it. It's a good read, okay? You will enjoy it. I know I got counseled the other day because I had said, this is not John Steinbeck, this is not Ernest Hemingway, it's O'Neill. But, and I was counseled by another writer, he said, don't say things like that. Tell people they're going to enjoy the book, and you will, I think. I think on all the people that have purchased it on Amazon, that have left a review. It's all five stars. So buy the book, okay? It's got a lot of great stories in there, people I've met and places I've been over this career of 65 years in the outdoors. Now, lastly, then I'll shut up about that, podcast of radio. You can listen to this show and my O'Neill Outside podcast at uh, Waypoint Outdoor Collection, Podcast Collection, Google, SoundCloud, Apple, uh, Spotify, all of those things. Just become a member there, and you can listen to the podcast. And if this is a not, a not enough for you, then that's available. So there you are. We are talking outdoors now. So uh, this was my, you know, was my first deer hunt. Uh, and I, I didn't see anything I wanted. Uh, I don't, I don't take does unless I'm ready to process those does then. Do that. Now, I've got a great hunt coming up this week. Uh, uh, a person made a contribution to the WSB child care. And so they, we auctioned that off. They paid $1,000 to go hunting this week. And we're going to go on Wednesday afternoon and Thursday of this week. And it's with an 8-year-old little boy. His grandfather, uh, the father, and the grandson. And we're all going to go hunting there in Oglethorpe County. A good friend of mine uh, let us go to his place. They're going to see lots. And he can take one if he likes. If he doesn't, then that's okay too. But it generated some funds for for Child Care of Atlanta. 17 after the hour. This is O'Neill, 404-872-0758-800-972-8255. Uh, when we come back after this next break, we're going, we have some really interesting questions on the guest book this week. And we'll get to those because one of them is about whether or not, well, we'll get to that. Okay. Uh, when is the rut in Georgia? Well, same time as last year. When is the rut where you hunt? Same time as last year. It's always the same. But there are certain things that go on geographically, weather-wise, where you hunt that has the level of activity which you have to pay attention to also. Cold weather, wind out of the east, how many other people are hunting at the same time. Uh, how far are you into the woods? And we're going to handle right now, it's 18 after the hour, I've got time to do that, the seven habits, because most all over Georgia and the Carolinas and so many other states, the rut has begun. The breeding season has begun, so we're going to talk about the seven habits of mature bucks during the rut. If you'll listen, keep these things in mind. Is it always hard and fast, the same things over and over and over again? Generally it is, but of course there'll be exceptions to that. But let's, let's talk about these things for a few minutes because... If it makes any difference to you, to me, it doesn't matter whether I shoot a deer or not. What makes a difference to me that I've that I I have hunted properly and made the best out of the place where I am, the times that I'm hunting, 
and that I'm safe so I can come back after the hunt, whether I take anything or not, and I can lie to you about it. Well, we can talk about it. So, the seven habits of mature rutting bucks. Minutes. They search for does in their hunting range. They don't venture far out of the range. Mule deer do. White dales do not. They feed much less during the rut. So that means you don't look for them in the food plot. You look for them on the edge of the food plot because they'll come to the food plot to see if there are does there, but they won't go into the food plot because they're not eating anyway. Here's the most important one. They move much more midday, they being whitetail bucks, they move much more midday than they do in the early and late early morning and late afternoon. What does that mean for you? That means that you should hunt all day. You've heard me say that so many times. They cruise certain areas more than others. They're repetitious. So if you see him at 10 o'clock in the morning, that doesn't mean that he won't be back there at noon or he won't be back there at 2 in the afternoon. Have faith. That's your deer that you're hunting. They spend less time on rubs and scrapes during the day than you would think. So you don't hunt the rub lines. You hunt the edge of the food plots. They visit the rubs and scrapes at night. Lastly, they spend sometimes 24 to 48 hours with a doe that has accepted him. So if he's vanished, he really hasn't. He's close by. More O'Neill outside when we return. It's 22 after the hour. Uh, 25 after the hour. Welcome back. You're listening to O'Neill Outside, the number one out live outdoor-based radio talk show in North America. And that's because you have supported us with your calls and your attention, and we're very grateful of that, for that. Of course, you're listening to 95.5 WSB and AM 750 across the country, all across the eastern states, to an audience of 800,000. On the Sports Broadcast Radio Network with 111 stations, big stations, all over the country, all the way to Maine, to Seattle, San Francisco, L.A., all throughout Texas and the Midwest to South Florida. So thank you again. So before we get to the uh, the guest book, let's uh, chat with Craig. Uh, Craig is calling from Evans, Georgia. Let me ring that up. Good morning, Craig. You're on the radio. How are you this morning? Oh, Neil, how are you doing? I'm doing just fine. You know, Evans is, a, a, Good. I guess, a bedroom community 15 miles northwest of Augusta, which is the home of the Masters. Yes, indeed. A few weeks ago. Yes, indeed, we were- Evans, Georgia. Well done. A, a few weeks okay. ago, we talked about coy dogs. I think a caller out of Pennsylvania brought up that the notion of coyotes mate with mm-hmm. dogs and getting these animals. That, you know, do, do foxes mate with coyotes? Not to my knowledge. I would be very surprised to hear that. I, the, I tell you, the reason uh, I bring that I, up, I would is, say, uh huh. No, you go ahead, sir. No, no, please. I, the reason the reason I say that is, you know, I was telling you, your screener, I know what a regular fox looks like. You know, and we have those out here. But then around here, we've got this magnificent-looking animal that's a really, really it's a, a, about coyote size, but it's, it, and it's kind of grayish-looking, but it's got the fox tail. It really looks like a big fox, and it's a magnificent animal. I, you know, I don't know about that. Maybe somebody will call us this morning. I'll write that down and answer that question for you next week. I, I would be surprised at that, but uh, there's an awful lot of things in the outdoors that have surprised me. So <laughs> without any education in this regard, uh, yeah. Uh, interesting question, very much. 
Have you started uh, deer season over there? Are you a deer hunter? Well, I, you know, I'm I'm a deer viewer. I just we have deer here. I put out, okay. you know, a, a corn plot and all the in an attempt to get some deer up here. And we've I've seen a few, but I was interested to find out that the bucks really didn't come out on the plots at this time of the year that much and we've we've got a salt lick and all that there. i just i just like to look at look at them i just that's you know we've got a a, a really a, a really nice young buck in the neighborhood here and it's i just i just like looking at them they're, they're pretty animals uh yes they are and if if and i know you probably already know this with a little research regarding the animal himself like i recommend for everything in the outdoors yes, you'll come to appreciate uh, you, you'll come to appreciate him even more and my greatest uh recommendation in that regard is uh join it doesn't cost much money i don't know how much it is but it's not much the quality deer management association okay. qdma and i'll tell you why they sent they always these aren't just a bunch of guys standing around at deer camp these are educated scientists that are deer hunters also yes sir and every time i am around them every time i receive some communication from quality deer management association i learn something about the yes, white-tailed sir. deer that i did not know again and you know, it, it's just my personal belief. The more you know about an animal or a place or a place where he lives, the more you are capable of enjoying those things. Just like with you, you don't have to shoot them to enjoy them. Yes, sir. That's exactly right. That's I agree. And like I so, said, I appreciate uh, your approach to the I, outdoors. I urge that. Well, thank you for for all you do. You're very entertaining and informative, sir. Well, <laughs> that'll keep me going for a while. I appreciate the compliment. Well, and, I, I appreciate. Uh, please we'll, do call again. Yes, sir. Sure will. Mm-hmm. Take care. Go ahead. Go ahead. Take, pl- go ahead. Take please. care, sir. Take care. Talk you to, bet. Talk, thank, talk to you later. Thank you. Thank uh, you, Craig. Bye-bye. You bet. Thank you, Craig. You got it. There we go. That's a nice call from. Well, I. Still have him a little bit there. Okay, it's uh, 30 minutes after the hour. Let's handle uh, a little bit of uh, the the uh, website guest book. If you would like to go to visit O'NeillOutside.com, in the middle of the home page on the guest book, among so many other things, you'll see a banner there called the guest book in which you can send questions observations uh evaluations or whatever you might to via the guest book to O'Neill outside and we'll ha- handle them here on the television show uh, radio show so here's one <coughs> excuse me i've been sick from uh cory and he writes from abilene texas he said i had not seen the show in several months due to programming changes to my cable lineup I went to look at your website, and I realized I can watch and everything else there and also on YouTube. Great. I won't miss any of O'Neill outside. So thank you very much, Corey, and I appreciate you mentioning that. Mike calls or writes from Waycross, Georgia. Have you ever found yourself in a dangerous situation while on the water fishing? And that question caused me to think quite a bit about that sort of thing. Uh, two times, the most situation that almost occurred uh, many, many years ago when I was quite young, a friend of mine, his name was Rick, he was my fishing partner, and we were both young enough that we would go to Lake Lanier because it's close by and we knew the lake. And we would uh, fish, and we would fish all night and still work the next day. We were young and spry enough to get that done. And we were on the lake one night uh, fishing at one of our spots, went over one of the sunken islands there, and uh, uh, we had our boat lights on. But evidently, excuse me, evidently someone else in 
uh, a, a call it a cruiser, but a bigger boat than usual, almost ran us down. He was running the lake with his lights on also, but he was going entirely too fast and not watching like he should have, and he almost hit us. That's the closest I've come. The only other time was kind of funny. I was uh, in a tournament at Jackson Lake, uh, and we were fishing up the river. It was daylight. It was sunny, and and regretfully, I did not have on my. Uh, no, I'm going to change. I'm going to change here just for a minute. I just thought of the most dangerous one. I was in a tournament at. Lake Sinclair, and it was during one of those March sleet and snowstorms. I was alone practicing for a tournament, and I was in a place called Potato Creek, because back up in the end of Potato Creek, there's a a, a big shallow flat with a stumpy flat. I thought there would probably be some shallow bass there. I was alone in a snowmobile suit, and back then, when we were younger, we would just turn the 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 trolling motor on, and you could control it by putting your foot on top of the trolling motor. I did not have a remote control trolling motor uh, apparatus. Uh, it was uh, the temperature was in the twenties, and I hit a stump and fell out of the boat. And the trolling motor was still running, you see. And I fell out of the boat, and I happened to catch the ski rope eye on the back of the boat with my finger as the boat started to trail away with the trolling motor running. I had another instance to tell you about, but it just occurred to me that that was the most dangerous one. So, yes, this app. Yes, I did not have on a uh, flotation device because I had on my snowmobile suit. But I caught the eye on the back of the boat and climbed up over the engine. Okay. Uh, Phil writes from Commerce, Georgia. What have I got? Have I got time? Yes, I do. Uh, Phil writes from Commerce. I was uh, on Hartwell last week. And the hybrids were busting all around, going after shad. I couldn't get a single bite. What's your favorite or most successful bait while fishing for hybrids? I can probably guess what was going on. If you were casting into schools of hybrids or white bass or stripers or anything like that, largemouth, spotted bass on the surface, and you're not getting bit, it's because your lure, whatever it was, a spoon, uh, Captain Mac Super Jig, whatever the case might be, it was because it was too large. 40 minutes after the hour, welcome to the program, everyone. The telephone numbers are 404 872 0750 or outside the Atlanta calling area and all over the world, it's 800 972 8255. Before we get to more of the guest book questions, let's chat now with. Bill, he's calling from Fayetteville, Georgia. Good morning, Bill. How are you? It's always a pleasure, Mr. O'Neill. It's your, your show's awesome every every Saturday. Uh, O'Neill, just a couple. Well, thank you very things. very much. Yes, sir. Just a couple quick things. Okay. Uh, the, the predators uh, and the importance of predators uh, in, uh, in every state in the union, mm-hmm. uh, but whitetail deer, folks. Uh, without hunters and predators. We wouldn't have a forest uh, because, believe it or not, deer, antelope, elk, they eat the tender, the tender uh, vegetation off the young trees, and they would actually destroy your forest without predators, hunters, hunters, and so forth. So, uh, do your homework before you before you complain about them. Uh, second thing on that, thank you for talking about safety. Absolutely. Thank you for talking about safety. My uh, my brother, an experienced angler. Fell out of the boat while docking down at St. Simon, and uh, let me tell you, we almost lost him. He did not have a life vest on. Went oh up boy. under the boat. Went up under the boat, and uh, we could have easily lost him. And uh, he's like he's been fishing all his life, and it just something that happened. So uh, you got to be How about careful. That? 
And, by the way, the Reds are running down at St. Simon. So if you're looking for a fishing trip, take off. Oh, boy, yeah. Uh, okay, thank you. You betcha. You. That is you so the time. At, at you. Well, you, I'm glad you brought that up. That That is the time for the Reds on the Georgia coast. And, and two, I think you can confirm if you're still there. Maybe not, Bill. i got to tell you, I've been to the Georgia coast at St. Simon's for redfish in the month of October, and I believe the minimum length limit is 22 inches for you to that keep. Is, they have to be under that, 22 and over. Is yeah, that about right? That is correct, but i got news for you. They, I will have, catch you. they were monsters. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. Well, that that was my point. I have, in all the times I've visited, all the number of times I've fished there on the Georgia coast for reds, I've never caught one small enough to keep. <laughs> exactly. They're gigantic. <laughs> they are gigantic. You got to let them go. They are, and that's what we do. They are huge. I would like to. I would. Yeah. I would like to keep a couple of them, but you can't. <laughs> They're no, all so big. It, but it. But it's a lot. I'm of glad you brought way. that up, pal. Uh, by the way, caught a couple of sharks too. Yes, sir. Wow, what fun! We couldn't get them in the boat, but we caught them. <laughs> oh, oh. they caught us. Oh Thank yeah, how, so how big were they? How big were they? Uh, six feet. Uh, we we figure about six feet. Oh one of them man, came up out of the water. One, one of them was actually coming up out of the water. It was unbelievable. Uh, so pe- if people are looking it's, for a it's, trip, it's, go to the coast. It's a it's really a thrill uh, to get a really and truly big fish on. Absolutely, uh, hey, and hey, uh, sharks uh, they'll uh, they'll stretch maybe. your string. That's for sure. Yeah, hey, uh, you bet. L- Glad you called, thing, pal. Hey, thank yeah. you, O'Neill, so much. Talk to you later. Uh-huh. Thank you. No, no. You if you got something if you've got something else, go ahead. Okay. Well, Bill's gone. Uh, I caught a two hundred and fifty pound. I was with Jimmy Johnson. Uh, when I say Georgia coast, I was at Amelia Island, you know, just right there, Georgia, Florida. And I caught a 250-pound shark, and which took quite a while. <laughs> and uh, so there you are. All right, now I've got a couple of other uh, mailbag questions here. I don't think I've got anything else I have to do right now. <coughs> Pardon me, I've been a little bit. Uh, Gail gave me a cold, that rascal. Okay, back to uh, the mailbag at O'NeillOutside.com. Tommy writes, uh, O'Neill, even after all these years on TV, you still maintain the same. You still remain the same. Never getting a big head at the length of popularity of your show and success. You are all about educating people. That's what makes you successful. Uh, at 44 after the hour, at 404-872-0750. Give me a moment. Uh, this is my canned speech for a moment. In in reaction to Tommy's compliment about not getting the big head about being on radio and television. My attitude is this. Being on television and radio is nothing. This is not important. What what I do does not make anybody well from being sick. I do not operate on you and and uh, make you well if you have something wrong with you. If you smell smoke at one o'clock in the morning, you're not going to call me. You're going to call a firefighter. If you hear the glass break at the back door at night and you suspect a a burglar or someone entering your home, you're not going to call me. You're going to call 911 for a policeman. I don't do anything important here. You can get along quite well without O'Neill. My family can't, I don't think, but you can. So being on television, it's always been a mystery to me, why, and I do meet several, why people, when they get a television show, they think there's something important about that. It's not. And that's why maybe Tommy has made an evaluation that I don't have the big head. I truly don't. Okay. 
Uh, Richard from Stone Mountain, I'm relatively new to muzzle loading. Do I need to clean the barrel after every time while I'm sighting in to get the best shot? No. You start the barrel and you put in a primer and fire it once or twice in the barrel and dirty it a little bit. If you're using Hodgson powder, which is clean, they, but you do need to foul the barrel just a little bit. Then I use power belt bullets. Now, what's so different about the power belt bullet? It is that the bullet itself, the metal, the copper, engages the rifling, not the plastic sleeve from a sabot or a subo. See, when you're using a, a sabot, the plastic in j- engages the rifling. The bullet is smaller than the caliber that you're using. When you're using a 50 caliber sabotted bullet, you're really using a 44 caliber bullet. So the bullet is smaller. If you'll use that's why the power belt bullet is so accurate. It's because the metal in the bullet engages the rifling. I would clean after four or five shots, but in between shots, I might run just a dry patch down the barrel once. That means you can maintain your accuracy. That's my way. A lot of you guys who do muzzle loading may have different ways. This is what I say. Richard from Stone Mountain wrote to me and not you. Jeff writes from Tampa, Florida. I always look forward to the new season of O'Neill Outside. You give practical advice. I feel like I'm never missing out. Your tips are the best, and I always learn something beneficial to my hunting and fishing seasons. Thank you very much. I will confess without hesitation that I get my tips my recommendations, my advice, not from my own experience only. No, no, no. I get it from Quality Deer Management Association, from the Wild Turkey Federation, from Realtree.com, from places like that that get so many people in contact there offering advice. I don't always agree with the advice, but the ones I do agree with, I pass along to you. This is an all not coming from O'Neill's tiny little brain. It's because I read, I look at websites, and I study, and I pick out things. Now, I will tell you that earlier someone wrote and said I'm in schooling hybrids or I'm in schooling fish and I can't get them to bite what's wrong it is my experience that your bait is too large I'll tell you a story years ago when I was in the tournament business if I got time for this I do when I was in the tournament business when I fished bass tournaments and I fished them for years and years and years and I was reasonably successful regionally I'm not a professional bass fisherman by no way fishing on the bass master circuit those guys are different okay I, I, I was never at that level but I have I have been to Lake Lanier and had stripers on the surface and not gotten bit. So when I went to do a tournament at uh, Lake Martin, and it was time to start spoon jigging, and I was using a sidewinder, and I could see the schools under the boat, but I was using a sidewinder, which is about three and a half inches long. I couldn't get bit. The next morning I was in for breakfast, at a restaurant in uh, Anniston, Alabama, and I heard some guys talk fishing. And I went over and said, hey, guys, I got fish all over me, and I can't make them bite. What's going on? What are you using? I'm using a sidewinder. He said, your your spoon is too big. Use a little, at the time it was called Tom Mann's 
Uh, it was just a, just like an inch long spoon. It was just a little piece of lead, like a road runner. Over the next three, I won that tournament, and over the next three days, I caught 270 bass because I changed the size of the lure. It's 52. We don't, uh, we don't have, uh, we got a lot of calls. Uh, I don't think I've got time to handle any one of them. Uh, I'm going to wait because everybody, all of you guys hold on, okay? I'll get to you when I come back at uh, 53. Uh, but those things you learn by going and doing and listening, but especially the deer hunting things, that's not campfire gossip. Those are tips and guides uh, and recommendations that are made by scientific organizations like QDMA and, and those people. I, the tips that I have here on the show are not just mine. No. But that one about the... I had a limit... Oh, during that tournament, it was a two-day tournament, I had a limit every morning at 7.30. I would rig six rods with these little, uh, Salty Dog, that was the name of that lure, and I would rig a Salty Dog six rods, and I'd catch a, a bass, throw the rod and reel down, drop another rod and reel down, and I'd catch another one, I quite often had six or eight bass, because some of them would flip off, I would have six or eight bass in the boat before the school dispersed. Only by changing the size of the lure. We've got a lot of calls. We're going to get to every one of them when, we're at, when we return. Uh, 57 after the hour. Let's get to the calls. What do you say? Mark's been holding on quite a while. Uh, let's talk to Mark calling from Camden County. Good morning, Mark. What's going on? Man, I'm picking my way across the Georgia Hello, Mark. side. Hello, can you hear me? <laughs> there you are. Yep. Yes, I'm, indeed, I, I can. Very well. Yeah, I'm picking my way across the back roads heading to Talbot County to hunt all day. Good for you. D- uh, this degrees. time of the year, do you stay in the stand all day? Yeah, uh, Uh-oh. I mean, the, the deer up here are just barely coming into the rut, so, but it, it's early enough to sit just as long as your buck can take it. <laughs> there you are. Yeah, Excellent I, recommendation. Uh, I actually got a tip, something that uh, happened okay. to me last weekend. I had uh, I had a crack at the largest buck that I've ever seen on the hoof last Sunday evening in Jeff Davis oh, County where the deer are already peaked in the rut right now. And... Uh, Mm-hmm. I missed him. I missed him. I checked my rifle, and I was two inches high and about three inches to the left. Somehow or another, I'd knocked my scope off of center. Didn't realize it. Oh, boy. Missed the largest buck that I've ever seen in my crosshairs in 50 years of deer hunting. That's Good. too bad. That, I, that happened to me one time, uh, and I'll tell, that, I'll tell it some other time. But, yeah, that, that happened to me also. I, I, that's too bad. That's a heartbreaker. Yes, sir, it is. That, uh that was uh, what I call a lifetime buck, probably a 150 plus eight point. Oh, and, uh, Ooh, yeah, boy, man, that's, that's huge. That's a piece of property I've been hunting for 29 years, and I take care of those deer and raise those deer. I've had pictures of that deer since he was a button buck. And, uh, oh, my goodness. Probably the first time I've laid my eyes on him in almost three years. He'd be seven years old now. Oh, but, uh, man, he's mature. Yeah. Hey, you were talking about our redfish a little while ago. I live down on the coast. If you uh, manage to make it down yes. after deer season's over with the St. Simon, I will show you how to catch 40 to 80 okay. reds a day on a light tackle, eight-pound tackle, pitching jigs. Uh-huh. And there'll be oh. the right size that you can actually well, keep put a me down fish for that. if you like. Yeah, 15 to 30-inch fish, eight-pound tackle, small creeks, trolling motor, little tiny boat. Good morning, boys and girls, from Black Powder Headquarters at Three Falls Cabin in the North Georgia Mountains. CVA presents Real Tree Radio. Welcome to a brand new, unused Saturday morning. Welcome to the show. 
Welcome to the show, everyone. I jumped in there too early. This is O'Neill Outside, and we'll get to our self-promotion later. I wanted to tell you that the program is brought to you by Works Tools, Realtree, Striplings, Tough Shed, CVA Muzzle Loaders, Snellville Heating and Air, Appalachian Gun and Range, Teeson's Outdoor Line Apparel, which you can buy online, and Rocco's Pub, and I'll be at Rocco's tonight. We want to get to a I've been holding on quite a while. I'll sacrifice the self-promotion when I can get to these calls right here. Let's do some of that right now. If we can bring up the call number one. If my computer's a little bit slow here, so Corey. So who is on call number one, sir? Is it Mike? Good morning, Mike. Welcome to the program. I'm sorry it took so long. Have I lost Mike? Evidently I lost Mike. That's too bad. He held on for quite a while, and uh, now I don't have him anymore. I guess not. So that's okay. Let's put him back on hold, and now let's go to the next caller, and that's John calling. Uh, John is calling from New York, I believe. If I can get him up there on the air with my equipment here. Good morning, John. Yeah, good morning. Uh, greetings from the Catskill mm-hmm. Mountains, where it's two more weeks until the rifle season, yeah. but we're enjoying good bow hunting. Good, good for you. Yep. Now, uh, the reason my call... It's, it's time I, I to that, be... Oh, yep. Go ahead, please. Uh, I was going to say, uh, when I'm bow hunting this time of year, um, when I walk to my tree stand or where, or where I'm going to sit, I don't walk directly to it. Uh-huh. I walk out in front like I would want a deer to walk for a perfect shot because I have had deer track me to my stands. And oh, yes. I've been, been able to get shots from, yeah. I've seen uh, absolutely when they, even to, yep. even. Go ahead. I was gonna say I've seen where they lost the tracks of a doe. They've been tracking, and they pick up my tracks and track me right in, and uh, give me a, a shot. That's good. Well, look, I got to go here now, but I do appreciate you calling from New York, uh, John. Uh, and please do so every week. I enjoy the call. Right now, I got to get out of here, if you don't mind. Yep. It's 12 after the hour. I promise we would get to all the calls that we can, and we will do that right now, holding on the longest this time. It's Bill, and he's uh, on the road, I believe. Bill is calling for O'Neill outside. Good morning, Bill. Good morning, O'Neill. It's Wild Bill Carson. You doing good, sir? Oh, my goodness. Good to hear from you, pal. Yeah, just uh, I'm, I'm, I'm headed to do a fishing gig, but I have hunting on my mind. And the reason why I do, O'Neill, is because uh, you, you probably remember this, but my father-in-law fell out of a deer stand a couple of years ago, and um, we thought we were going to lose him. He had to be life flighted to Atlanta Medical Center, and he has made a complete recovery. And uh, last night, hunting from a ground blind at the ripe age of 86 years old, he took a really nice eight pointer, and uh, they sent it to me on my phone. And that is definitely a happy time. Uh, with that in mind, I just want to remind all the listeners out there that you know safety is paramount. On a day like today, when there's frost on the pumpkin, you put your foot on that tree stand rung and you start climbing up it. And uh, the opportunity, if you call it an opportunity to fall, is uh, very real, and it can change your life. So uh, make sure that you use yes. the safety harnesses and make sure that you uh, know what you've got your hands on and your foot on whenever you're climbing into that stand today. I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't ask for a greater call this morning than what you just said. Perfect. Good deal. Well, give Mrs. Williams my best, and I uh, hope to see you soon, my friend. You bet. Good luck to you, pal. See ya. There we go. That's a, Bill is an outstanding outdoorsman. Let's see who's coming up next. I think it's Tim is calling from Powder Springs, Georgia. Good morning, Tim. What's going on with you? you? It's 14 after the hour. How you doing, O'Neill? Thank you very much. Oops. O'Neill. Okay, what's going on? Oh, yes, sir. I have a. Can you hear me? Yes. O'Neil. What I yes. had happened yes. was I was I can hear you I was fine. fishing. Okay, perfect. I was fishing down at um, a tournament, um, benefit tournament down out of Highland Marina in West Point, 
and my partner Billy Ray and I had gotten into a brand new boat. I won't name the, mention the name. And we were uh, idling out. I put on my life vest, and shortly after takeoff, like within seconds, the motor fell off the back, swung me out of the boat in March, and had to have Kenny Carroll down there Ooh. recover me around all of the flying by me boats that were, were going on. And the reason I'm calling is to remind everyone to check your equipment. But what ended up happening was the jack plate, which was newly installed, did not have the bolts uh, tightened down with the nuts on the back. So it ended up just basically oh. uh, rattling off of the off of the boat, and the motor completely came off of the boat. And when that happened, it slung me out of the boat. Would imagine so. I'm glad you made it. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you. Well, you, you, hey, we go on all these trips, hunting trips and fishing trips, so we can come back safely and then lie about it. <laughs> well, let me tell you, we're so down in town to Ups and, Ups and County right now with my dad. He's 76, and we're going to go try to get uh -huh. some deer down there. So that's where we're headed. You have a great day, sir. Good. You too. Glad you called, pal. You bet. There we go. Now let's uh, let's see. My timing is 16 after the hour. I'm in good shape there. Who's up next? Uh, well, we'll go chat now with Don. Don is calling, of course, from Ocean Isle, North Carolina. Do <laughs> Always a pleasure to hear from you, sir. How you doing this morning, Kevin? Good, good. I've got a little cold, but I'll I'll get better by the moment. That'll, that'll go away in, in due time. Yeah, the, the temperature is cooling yes. down so over here now. We're finally water temperature is coming down and if you pretty soon you'll have to hunt them 80s off the Gulf Stream to do any king fishing but in the meantime you know the bottom fishing's still there and that's all always catch and eat for us you know so oh oh yeah you bet you bet yep. Ross had neck surgery uh two or three weeks ago and he's going to be incapacitated this season and um uh, but um, maybe this will get him through it, and he'll be able to pick it up next year. So, uh, um, well, is he, uh, is he okay? Is, yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Son. He's progressing. He's progressing very good, and um, it's um, you know he's a little bit um, uh, anxious about getting back on the move. But you know that's that may be um, a, a bad thing because he needs to recuperate from the, they, those are tough operations. I got yep. you. Well, I'm I'm glad he's doing okay and he's and he is progressing, and I'll look forward to your description of his hunts later. That was maybe maybe next year <laughs> we'll be like the Brooklyn no, Dodgers. So. Wait, okay. wait we can next, count wait on next year. <laughs> Always wait yep. till next year. Glad you called, Don. Hi, right, Kevin. Enjoy you. Always video. a pleasure. Always. <laughs> You bet. Always a pleasure to hear from you. Let's see. It's 18 after the hour. We've got time for this. Let's talk to, hey, let's talk to Mac. He's calling on line number one. Good morning, Mr. Mac. Captain Mac, what do you say? Good morning, O'Neill. How are you doing? Well, I've got a little, uh, yeah, I'm doing fine. We've got a little telephone delay here of a few seconds, so bear with me. What's going on with you? How's fishing on the lake? You know, fishing's been pretty good. Uh, I would say better than normal for we just are in our turnover, going through the turnover time. I think fishing's been – it's the lake's fish better this year than it normally does during that time frame. So a couple things for guys to look for. If you're going today, have something tied on. Uh, a lot of top water fish, a lot of schooling activity, very sporadic, but it's happening often enough. You need to be prepared for it. Uh, a lot of fish around points and humps. All over the board depth wise, which is typical when the lake turns over, but pretty good live bait bite, but it may be down lines, maybe free lines. You need to be prepared to do both. And a lot of but bass fishing's good, a lot of top water fish. Uh today I it might be a little tougher today after we have those big bluebird skies, this big front it might be more of a uh drop shot worm type bite, but overall good and a lot of the bass too, they're really mm -hmm. oriented to the humps. Like main lake humps, uh 
Oh, I don't know. The depth again is real scattered out, 10 to 25. But all in all, good fishing, and uh, the crappy bites really picked up, so it's it's pretty good. So tough decision. You're going deer hunting and going fishing. I'd say do both. All right, let me ask you a question quickly because earlier in the program, a fellow called and said he had fish on the surf a few times he's been. He was either hybrids or stripers, but he couldn't get them to bite. So uh, I'll tell you, I told him his bait was too large. What would you say? I would say your bait's too large. <laughs> Most probably. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, no. It, it, a lot of these fish will start feeding on very small thread fins this time of year, and we got to match mm-hmm. the hats. And so if he's feeding on two-and-a-half-inch baits and you're throwing a five-and-a-half-inch bait, sometimes that won't work. They can be that size specific, which is kind of odd. When you see a fish on top like that, you think he's just wide open bites anything and they can be but they can be very specific and we're starting to see that now so 10 lighter line smaller baits and it's a it's a tough concept we're looking for a really big fish you know a big striker we're looking at a big bait right not necessarily so uh you and i right. talked about this inline spinner baits small spoons a small bucktail is always good to throw so just downsize mm-hmm. a little bit and you'll probably catch them yeah, they're, you're, isn't it funny? I have actually seen, and I'll drop the call, but I have actually seen my spoon, when I used to use a sidewinder, roll over the back of a striper and him ignore it. <laughs> yes. It but when I threw a small spoon, he bit it. Yeah, yeah. no kidding. Glad you called, Mac. Have a great weekend. You bet. Everybody be safe. And I'll see you soon, pal. You bet. That's the key. There you are. We got to get out of here. It's uh, 21 after the hour. This is O'Neill outside. Uh, welcome back, everyone. This is O'Neill. Let's talk to Hank, and then we're going to have our radio prize package question. So let's uh, let's talk to Hank the Yank right now at 25 after the hour. This is O'Neill. Uh, O'Neill outside. Good morning. Four zero four eight seven two zero seven fifty. Yes, thank you for your help. <laughs> well, I just thought I'd promote a little bit. Well, listen, he, he, here's what's good. going on. It, 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 you're, you're on the clock if you want to strike for fish and catch a fish with a fly rod. It all started yesterday. We had a big blow come through. Water temperatures cooled down to 68 degrees. The fish are chewing on the surface. You need to be throwing super small baits because the fish are eating between one and two inch thread fin shad, one inch to two inch. So unfortunately, as much as I love fishing a sidewinder spoon with a a conventional rod, it's just not going to do it. You've got to fish a something else fly on a, a, and and throw that actually either behind the spoon if if you're a conventional angler, or you better learn how to throw a fly. It's just that simple. There you are. Well done. (laughs) Well said. There, there, there you are. That's what's going on. So, yeah, I took Jimmy Harris out. Uh, we took a ride around the lake because if I start firing up, I am booked now through the end of January. If I tell you I might have five days open at the most, we're booked solid. But we went out looking just to see, you know, we're on the new moon, and we talk about how the moon phase is helped the fishing tremendously. And we went out after yesterday's blow, after Halloween's blow, and the fish were all over the surface, just about everywhere we went on the lake. We saw fish up, and uh, we put four stripers into the uh, into double digit size on, uh, in the boat. And uh, so we had we had a really good trip for a couple hours late in the afternoon. Fantastic! No wonder so you're booked. Gotta, yeah, we're we're staying booked. Everything is good. It's all good, you know. And I'm sure, as you know, this is happening all over the South. Because tell us about stripers. They don't know where they live. There you go. My favorite line of all time. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best. And it's uh, the Hank, so Hank the Yank's got a book coming out. Hank the Yank has a book coming out, and we cannot wait to read it. It's going to be wonderful, the, I'm sure. Going to the publisher uh, next week, about 66,000 words on how to catch a striper, whether you're a fly or a conventional angler. It'll give you all the techniques and how-tos to catch them in rivers and lakes throughout the United States. And uh, we even have O'Neill in the book. His, his, his fingerprints are all over it as well. So, but anyway, listen, oh boy. I want to tell oh you, boy. I want to tell you one more thing before I get off and let you go to the next caller. Very important day today. Okay. Go, 
Go dog. Okay. Sick them. Beat a little flip. We got to oh. eat some gator this afternoon. <laughs> woof, woof. <laughs> well done. All right, my good All friend, right. thank you for the call. We always learn something when you do that, and I appreciate it. You take care, pal. There we go. Well, you bet. I'll see you soon. There you go. All right, time for the radio prize package. Time to put your brain in gear. It's really an easy question today. Telephone numbers are 404-872-0750 or outside the Atlanta calling area and all over the country to all our SB Nation stations. The number is 800 WS. SB Talk. That's 972-8255. You have to be 18 years old, and you do not get to ask the question a second time, and it takes us two weeks to get the goods to you. And here uh, is the prize pack. You get a one week at the Appalachian Gun Range, a permit for a whole week, a Bojangles gift card for 10 bucks, Whitetail Institute DVD about planting food plots, an Angler Magazine, DNR rigs, a thunder chicken from Captain Mark Noble, a can of Fisher's Choice Baits, a selection of True Turn Tackle, a Swaggerty's coupon at store level. You get to eat Swaggerty's free. And the question is, Travis, my grandson, has been on the show many times before, and he is a veteran outdoorsman. What is his last name? It's not just Travis. He does have a last name, 404-872-0750-800-972-8255. Now, he's uh, not calling about that, so let's talk to Jason. He's calling from Fairmount, Georgia. What a lovely place, Jason, that you yes, live sir. in Fairmount. Yes, sir. It's a great place. You blink and you missed it. Well, um, that's, and that's good. I know. I love it. It's a small town. Everybody knows everybody. Anyway, what I was wanting to call you about is uh, I'm heading out to the tree stand today. It's 32 degrees, so I can't wait. Um, have you heard about these new methods of uh, getting up the tree to do your hunting? No, I have not. Okay, so it started with John Eberhardt back in the 80s. He, uh, he does what's called saddle hunting. And since then, uh, late 80s, they come out with uh, what's called trophy line. The company went out. And then now recently, everybody's starting to catch on to it. It's kind of like a lineman's belt where you climb up in the tree like you're going to, you know, trim the tree. But it, the, the, oh, the saddle is yes. designed, yeah, they're designed for deer hunting and comfort rather than, you know, uh, work. So now we got new saddle products. Right. Like yeah, feathers. I've heard about that. You're correct. Yes, sir. And uh, I love it. I, 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 last year I bought mine and I had a tree stand and I thought, well, I'll just wait and see how I like this. Before the end end of the season, I went ahead and sold my tree stand. I'm never going back. How and about that? I'll have to it, look into that and give it a try. Yeah, it's awesome. 360 degrees around. You get up in any tree. You got bigger tree selection, better shot. Uh, better shot. You can shoot all the way around the tree. It's quiet. If if you're a hunter like me that likes to go two miles in, you don't have to carry a clanky stand on your back. You just throw it all in your bag and just head out. <laughs> Well, tell me the give me the brand of that again, please, Jason. Well, Trophy Line's coming out with a new one. Then you've got H two, then you've got Tethered, then you've got Arrow Hunter. Uh, a lot of companies are coming out with these saddles now, and you're constantly tied to the okay. tree, so you can't fall out of the tree. So I would consider it a lot safer as well. If you know what you're doing, if you're using the gear correctly, you can't fall out of the tree. That. That's the ultimate reward. Very much. I love coming home to my family. back safely. You bet. Yes, sir. Good deal. Thanks. Hey, listen, thank you for the call. That's really good. I like yes, that. Yes, sir. You have a good day and good morning, and uh, I'm going to go out and try to get me one. <coughs> good deal. Call me back next week. Let me yes, sir, I will. Good deal. I mean that, too. There we go. Okay, we've got a lot of calls, and we uh, I'm sure we probably have a winner. Yes, we do. <coughs> Excuse me. This is O'Neill with O'Neill outside at 532. And the question for the radio prize package was, my grandson's first name is Travis. He's been on the show many, many times. And I know this question is probably entirely too easy, but I didn't have time to come up with a better one. So let's talk to Betty. And she's calling from 
I don't know where you're calling from, Betty. Monroe, Georgia, Walton County. Uh, oh, Monroe, yes, indeed. Why is what's uh, what's the background with Monroe, Georgia? Is for the president, or what was that for? I'm not really sure. Perhaps it could be. I'm I'm more attuned to what is happening in Loganville. Although we have a Monroe address, we don't live in the city. We live closer to Loganville. I I see. Well, it's. I lived in Snellville for 35 years, so I'm very familiar with it. And yeah. I used to hunt when I was very awful lot in, in uh, Loganville, out in the country. I know it. Yes, boy, it's not the country okay. now. Uh, I'm sure it's not. Okay, <laughs> uh, and uh, the answer to the question is, it is Travis... Who? Johnson and all of us Johnsons live down here, and we may be kin. Uh, hey, <laughs> inbreeding can be fun. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Surprising what you okay. come up with. <laughs> all right, well, uh, we'll put you back on hold, and uh, so that we can get the proper information from you. Okay. And it'll cut, take a couple of weeks to uh, get it get it all to you. And I thank you for your participation in the show. Thank you very much. You bet. Thank you. I'll put Betty on hold, and there we are. All right, 404-872-0750-800-972-8255. We've get, we got time for this one. He's been holding on quite a while, and uh, I think we're going to talk to Wade from Kentucky. Are we going to talk with you this morning, Wade? Good morning, O'Neill. Can you hey, hear me? there you are. Hey, buddy. I can doing? indeed. All right. You got a little delay going on today. Yeah, yeah. It's a two or three second delay makes it, but we'll manage. We'll try to be patient. Do Do you remember this phrase? Where's Loganville? Oh. <laughs> do you remember no, that? Don't. What's that? No, I do not. I'm they were a Chevrolet dealership down there, and they used to advertise on WSB out of Atlanta on Channel oh, Two. Where's Logan? Uh, how about that? And it's where uh -huh. Loganville. Oh, back back in the early eighties, nobody knows where oh. Loganville was. We lived up in North Connect. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, I'm, how are you doing, sir? Have you started your deer season? Uh, next week. They, it, it starts up here. It's already started. But I'm going next week. Been seeing them move around okay. over here in that Good big soybean field. Yes, sir. They they cross okay. from that well, soybean field over fine. to the power line. Been seeing them regularly in the morning, early in the morning. Yeah, imagine the kids well, on the good. school bus you're, you're, watching them morning. You're all set and, for a, a great start. Oh, yeah, it's beautiful up here. Uh, we had 26 degrees this morning. Ooh, boy, well, you're on the way. Yeah, we had like three inches you're of rain the way. last four days. Uh huh. Well, you're uh, you're on the way for a great start. I got to go right now, pal, so let's let's chat next week. What do you say? Uh, welcome back. We've got a lot of calls, and we'll give you every one of them if we can. And we have the Medal of Honor coming up in a few minutes. Let's chat, first of all, with Rob. Rob is calling from Maine. Good morning, Rob. You're on O'Neill Outside. Welcome to the show. Good morning, sir. How are you? Lovely. Great. Hey, listen, uh, just touching base. About 15 years ago, we were on the air together, and we were talking about uh, how, the, how deer hunting's changed over the years. And I was just thinking yes. about that this morning, sitting at the house. And right now I'm in, sitting in Seal Cove, Maine, about to get onto a lobster boat for a three-mile ride off the coast to an island to go deer hunting. And Good for you. The, uh, yeah, today's open day of deer season up here. And uh, I've been working on a boat up here for a couple of years now. I used to live in Roswell and decided to move to colder climates. And mm -hmm. the uh, taking a couple of young boys out hunting today. But... Wonderful. Keeping Good it to you. Those are the things I love to hear about. Yeah, we had our conversation the last time. There, night. the white. Yeah, they're starting to breed. Uh, there was a friend of mine got a picture on camera yesterday of a buck mountain of doe right in front of his camera. Oh boy! The, uh... <laughs> well, it'll be for both you. It'll be an exciting day for you and your guests. We we took a bunch of boys out to this island last year about this time, and uh, seven of us hit the island that day, and we took four deer off the island in four hours. So uh, 
You know, we're wow. kind of hoping for another repeat this year. And I was going out. There's only four of us. There's a guy I fish with and his two sons. But uh, mm-hmm. people get too wrapped up in having all the new I would have to, and, Going and hunting and preparing and doing the hunt is what counts, not what you shoot. Oh, yeah. We've got some doe tags to fill up here this year. The state's pretty liberal on issuing uh, tags out along the coast due to overpopulation issues. So we're going to go do our best and help the uh, owner of this island thin a few out. But the uh, good. How big is the uh, island, sir? Uh, this island is pretty close to about 980 acres. Uh, it's got one okay. large kind of split field down the middle of it, big hay field out there around this. It's a small working farm in the summer. And uh, this hay field out there is pretty close to about a half mile long, so we got plenty of room for the four of us. But the uh, Good for thing you. that we talked about 15 years ago, stuff we're trying to teach the kids today, is not get too wrapped up in buying all the newest gimmicks. You know, each of us is going to walk out with a couple of rounds in our pockets and a couple of lever guns and a couple of apples and some bottles of water, a knife, lighter, and a compass. There you are. Hey, that sounds like a that does sound like a fifteen year old hunt. But the uh you know, it's kinda of, kind of exciting this year to get these guys out there and hopefully get the next generation hooked like us old farts are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got it. Hey, great. It's, listen, it's good to hear from you. I hope you call yeah, again soon. You too. And certainly do please call next week and let me know how you did on this hunt. Will you do that? I will, sir. Give Woman Williams my best. I will do that. Thank you, sir. All right. That's Thank good. you. That's a nice call from Rob. That's a nice call from Rob. We have uh, we have the time before the Medal of Honor for me to pick up this caller right here, I think. Uh, moment. You stick with me, Dad, just for a moment. It's 43 after the hour. We've got calls there, but I don't. Hey, let's talk to Tommy. He's calling from, he hadn't been holding on, Tommy from Sparta, Georgia. Good morning, Tommy. O'Neill. Hey. O'Neill. How are you? This is Tommy from Sparta, yes. Georgia. How are you? Hey, what do you, what do you plan on doing down there today anyway? Do you plan on hunting or just hanging out at camp? No, sir. I had to get up early just to call you. I told you I would call you yesterday. <laughs> so. Yes, you did. It's 30. It's, it's 38 degrees in Sparta, and I'm going to go sit for seven hours in the uh, in the pines. There you, you are. You'll probably do well today. Is the what, what's the uh, rut map? What's the time zone? What's the premier time today? Bullseye! You are you are per. I've lost the rut is happening, and you're in it. Oh well, I'm sorry, Tommy. I say the, the the rut is happening, and you are in it. You're right on top of it. So you should have a good day, and I expect, well, I'm going to telephone you Monday or Tuesday and find out what you did, and don't lie to me. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. I woke up early just to call you, and uh, I hope you have a great day. Well, thank you. you well, I will, I, and I hope you do, too. Good luck to you and your party. Thank you, O'Neill. You bet. See you, pal. I apologize to everyone listening to the show this morning. We've had some technical glitch in which the uh, the timing of my aunt, my conversation and the conversation from the caller is off by a few seconds. So if it sounds like we're stumbling around with it, it's true. We are stumbling around with it, but there's nothing for us to do about it right now. So uh, we'll we'll do the best we can, and we'll straighten it out, I'm sure. Um, uh, our engineer in Peachtree City, uh, I've told you this before, her name is Karen Green. The, the program goes from right here at the cabin in North Georgia, and it goes to WSB Radio in Atlanta over an Internet line. Then it goes to Peachtree City, Georgia, at a studio there, manned by Karen and Brian Green, real engineers, really engineers, not me. And then it goes there to somewhere in Texas, Fort Worth or somewhere. And then there it goes to 110 stations on the Sports Broadcast Network nationwide. So it's quite an engineering feat. 
And uh, Karen it has a nickname. Houston, as in Houston, we have a problem. Because no matter what the problem is, whether it's fixing the transmission on your car or engineering a radio show or a television program or flying a plane or playing professional saxophone in a jazz group, she can do it. And that was Gail's nickname for Karen Green, and it's Houston. As in Houston, we have a problem. And we could not operate this television and radio program without her. That doesn't mean she's going to get a raise at all. Uh, it means probably we'll cut her hours because she's very efficient. It's almost 48 after the hour, and if my engineering department can, can manage it, and if everything's queued up at 548 this morning, it's time for the Medal of Honor tribute. And we'll wait for that introduction. And I'll read this tribute to you. If Corey is Honor, ready. courage, and strength of character. And these here we qualities go. are embodied by the recipients of the Medal of Honor. Now let's recognize this week's Medal of Honor recipient on O'Neill Outside. Chaplain Charles Waters, Army, November 1967, Vietnam. Chaplain Waters was moving from with one of the company engaged a heavily armed enemy battalion. As the battalion raged and the casualties mounted, Chaplain Waters, with complete disregard for his safety, rushed toward the line of contact. Unarmed and completely exposed, he moved along in front of the advancing troops, giving aid to the wounded, assisting in their evacuation, and giving words of encouragement and administrating the last rites to the dying. When a wounded paratrooper was standing in shock in front of the assaulting forces, Chaplain Waters ran forward, picked the man up on his shoulders, and carried him to safety. As the troopers battled to the first enemy entrenchment, Captain Waters, Chaplain Waters, ran through the intense enemy fire to the front of the entrenchment to aid the fallen comrade. In short time later, the paratroopers pulled back in preparation for a second assault. Chaplain Waters exposed himself to both friendly and enemy fire between the two forces in order to recover two wounded soldiers. Later, when the battalion was forced to pull back into the perimeter, Chaplain Waters noticed that several wounded soldiers were lying outside the newly formed perimeter. Without hesitation and ignoring the attempts to restrain him, Chaplain Waters left the perimeter three times and to face the small arms and all weapons and mortar fire to carry and to assist the injured soldiers to safety. Satisfied now that all the wounded were, were inside the perimeter, he began aiding the medics. Chaplain Waters was giving aid to the wounded when he himself was shot. Chaplain Waters' unyielding perseverance and selfless devotion to his comrades was in keeping with the highest traditions of the U.S. Army. Chaplain Waters died that day, November 1967. It's 50 minutes after the hour. This is O'Neill with O'Neill outside. We've got a few more minutes. Uh, and let me ring this up right here and see who this caller is. Otherwise, you'll just have to listen to O'Neill and another one of his uh, usually insane tips. But I want to do this. Uh, one of the things I want you to keep in mind when you're deer hunting this fall, if you've got a particular deer, like when we had a call earlier from Mark, and he missed his prize biggest white tail he's ever seen in Georgia. Do this. Recite your deer rifle in often. And if someone else uses your rifle or you use someone else's rifle, sight it in. This week during my hunting trip with Tanya Higgins, I had sighted in my uh, CVA Cascade Bolt Action Centerfire. I had sighted it in. I had two. In, I had a, a three-shot group 
that touched each other that were two inches high at 50 yards. We decided we should let her sight the rifle in. Her first shot at 100 yards was four inches high. That, quite frankly, I expected because the bullet was still probably rising. We adjusted the scope, the Kona scope, we adjusted it at four inches down, and her next shot was bullseye, and bullseye, and bullseye. Always recite your rifle. If you've been had that rifle on a plane in the luggage department, and you're shipping it, or you're packing it, and when you get where you're going... And all throughout the season, my goodness, recite your rifle with the same cartridge and same weight that you're going to use in your hunt. If you are experienced and you're calm and you exhale and softly pull the trigger. You're doing that if you're going to shoot the deer, you need to do a favor to him or her and dispatch her or him neatly and quickly. And that's what Tanya did this week. Uh, I'm going to close the show today. That's the show being on Hill Outside. Uh, if you'll permit me with a couple of expansions to call our sponsors of the program, and I'm trying to do you a favor so you can give it a try. Two things. Number one, Appalachian Gun and Range in Jasper, Georgia. Fully equipped store with a range, 25 and 50 yards. But here's a tip there that's not in the ad that I want to tell you about. They also, at Appalachian Gun, they operate as a pawn shop. So for if you're looking for a rifle or a shotgun, they are likely because of its that it, they do operate as polo, they've got some outstanding deals on rifles and shotguns and pistols, okay? That's a little extra about Appalachian gun. Number two. I just accepted advertising from and now I use Tesons wildlife apparel Tyson's camo okay it's spelled T H I E S S E N S but it's pronounced Tyson's I'm going to tell you about this for a minute a little things that aren't in the ad that will make a difference to you if you have an opportunity to purchase some or if you go you're about to do some camo buying Number one, you buy it directly from the manufacturer. It's inexpensive. Number two, it's really quality stuff. Number three, morning, the hoods on everything are detachable. That makes a big difference. Number three, the zippers are really heavy duty. The pockets are huge. The thighs are real big so you can put your pants on over your boots. And the zippers and the bottom of the camo pants are also large, so you don't have to take your boots off when you put on your camo. It's called Tyson's, T-H-I-E-S-S-E-N dot com. Glad you joined us this morning. It's always a pleasure to be with you on the air. And if you're too busy to go fishing and take a kid along, you're too busy. We'll see you guys next week. I once asked a mighty hunter, a coming home from the field, how he came to possess such mighty hunting and fishing skill. He said, I'll tell you a secret, son. I learned everything I know from listening to O'Neill outside on my radio.